Dear colleagues, a very good morning to you and a warm welcome to the UNESCO New Delhi Cluster Office for Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. The theme of the breakaway session at UNESCO is Strengthening SARC Through Digital Heritage. Since the first edition of the KEDL in 2017, we have been delighted at the interest among major libraries in South Asia in forming a regional network or alliance. The objective of such a network would be to share knowledge, best practices, capacities, and digital resources. While a tentative conversation about a SARC level network was initiated at the KEDL 2017, the idea began to gain greater traction in the following year. In November 2018, the Royal Government of Bhutan and UNESCO co-organized a regional workshop in Thimpu for librarians and professionals working to preserve documentary heritage. The workshop concluded with stakeholders agreeing unanimously on the need for a regional mechanism to promote the management of digital and documentary heritage. Today's session offers us an opportunity to take these discussions forward. As we begin our deliberations, UNESCO would like to reiterate its commitment to the NDLI. We are also very grateful to our partners, IIT Delhi, Terry, Europeana, and the Wikimedia Foundation, who have helped make KEDL 2019 a reality. We would also like to take a moment to remember our dear colleague, Dr. Indrajit Banerjee, formerly director of UNESCO's Knowledge Societies Division in Paris. Dr. Banerjee was in many ways the driving force behind UNESCO's partnership with the NDLI. Sadly, we lost him to a sudden illness earlier this year. We would like to dedicate today's session to his memory. Now, please allow me to invite Mr. Ezekiel Dalamini, the Advisor for Communication and Information for South Asia at UNESCO New Delhi office to deliver the welcome remarks. Distinguished delegates and experts, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, SAC. The region consists of eight countries, although we have six represented here today, separated by political boundaries, but that share a common heritage of several millennia. Political, um, colonial, uh, colonial past, ethnicity, long tradition of economic and cultural exchanges and aspirations. For this reason, a mechanism propose, uh, promoting shared digital heritage in SARC, facilitated by UNESCO, can greatly increase regional cooperation. The UNESCO Member of the World Program was established in 1992 in recognition of the growing awareness of the importance of preserving and assessing documentary heritage. Around the world, collections were and are still exposed to a variety of threats, such as illegal trade, destruction, natural disasters, and loss of interest, leaving them vulnerable to being lost. Documentary heritage in institutions such as library, libraries, archives, and museums constitute a significant part of the memory of humanity and reflect linguistic and cultural diversity of peoples. The issue of preserving this heritage has been a source of concern to governments and experts who are familiar with its fragility and the ensuing risks of losing important sources of information. In 2015, UNESCO member states adopted the recommendation concerning the preservation of and access to documentary heritage, including in digital form. Although nominations to the Member of the World Program of UNESCO especially to its international register, register, regional and national registers 
are not are, are currently on hold, uh, uh, are not are not in, uh, um, going on at the at the moment. This normative normative instrument is designed to help build partnerships for developing appropriate solutions, skills to mitigate against risks faced by documentary heritage, so that valuable collections and records are never lost. It cannot be overemphasized that digital heritage systems need to be designed with inclusive accessibility in mind, paying particular attention to information seekers and users with disabilities. For instance, digital images and videos need to be accompanied by text or audio descriptions or even sign language interpretation of their subject's key features, e.g. content or form, and should be captured with the highest resolution possible so that they can be resizable. These are just some of the things that I'm sure are already being practiced, but I would like to raise, you know, bring them to the table today for your consideration because we really should not leave anybody behind as we go forward in our design of preserve, uh, pre preserving uh, digital heritage. UNESCO hopes that <coughs> deliberations here will lead to a proposal for the establishment of a digital he uh, heritage platform for the SAC region. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dalamini. We will now begin with the first keynote session for which Mr. Ben Vershbo would chair the session. Mr. Ben Vershbo is the Director of Community Programs at the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit organization supporting Wikipedia, Wikidata, and nearly a dozen other open knowledge projects. He leads a globally distributed team focused on growing participation and partnership across the Wikimedia movement in key knowledge areas, such as GLAM, education, science, and gender sensitivity, gender diversity. May I request Mr. Vershbo to take the session forward, please. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here, and it's a real honor to be uh, at UNESCO uh, here in Delhi. Um, before I introduce Professor Das, I just wanted to share a few framing thoughts uh, that are sort of picking up on where uh, the closing session left off yesterday. Mr. Uh, um, I'm going to mispronounce his name, John Van Udenaren, uh, who gave that virtual presentation on the World Digital Library, reflect reflecting on one of the early efforts to create a common digital heritage platform. Um, uh, Mr. Van Udenaren uh, posed an, an interesting um, uh, thought that digital libraries should mediate between the heterogeneity of the cultural collections that they are aggregating and the homogeneity that users expect. Um, I was reflecting on this a lot last night and into this morning, and uh, I'm not sure homogeneity is quite the word I would, I would look to, but uh, I see what he was getting at. And I think that uh, this is the challenge I think aggregators have, fa have, have faced as, they, as, they've, as they've tried to kind of scoop up vast amounts of heterogeneous content uh, and try to offer that coherently to, to a vast public. Um, for moving from homogeneity, I started to con contemplate perhaps the notion of connectivity or fluidity or serendipity, which of course I think is the hallmark of all great libraries. And um, I would also like to, uh, at, at the end of his talk, Van, uh, Van Udenaren also um, made a critique of the current age of aggregators, which I thought was interesting and should be kind of borne in mind. Um, perhaps the fallacy of, of trying to work at that scale uh, and, and simply to put that kind of vast heterogeneity behind a search box and expect uh, that people will just, just come. And um, I was reflecting that um, maybe a year or two after the World Digital Library launched, another really bold early experiment in digital aggregation launched, which was the Flickr Commons. Are, folk, are folks here familiar with the Flickr Commons? Do people remember? Um, this was perhaps the first credible uh, attempt at scale to aggregate cultural collections. And, um, and it was a springboard uh, because of its APIs and infrastructure for experimentation and creative reuse, remixing and, and playfulness in a way that we had never seen. And I think that we're still kind of working uh, in, in the wake of that. Um, Flickr Commons required significant preparatory work in terms of rights assessment, as we know. We all remember the famously kind of soft focus designation, no known rights restrictions, which now sort of lives on in the rights statements framework. Um, but uh, there was not an overly laborious pro uh, preparation around the metadata. Uh, it was actually for the Flickr communities to come together 
in collaboration with the institutions to develop that fluidity, to develop that connectivity, and to develop that, uh, that serendipity. And I think that's what made the Flickr Commons experiment so magical. And it's something I think we're still trying to emulate. And certainly uh, in the Wikimedia movement, as we've been working through in a very distributed fashion to aggregate heritage at global scale, I think we've been rehearsing for the largest scale aggregation yet. And, so, and we think that regional aggregators have a key role to play in this, in kind of assembling this full picture of global heritage. So I just wanted to kind of put that additional uh, kind of um, marker in the history of early attempts at aggregation with Flickr Commons to reflect on that. And um, uh, I think it's a thought we ought to bear in mind, um, that fluidity and that connectivity and that serendipity that we're trying to foster. Uh, so I will now uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Professor Das. Uh, Dr. Partha Pratim Das is the Joint Principal Investigator of the National Digital Library of India, uh, which is uh, sponsored by the MHRD, the Govern uh, Government of India. He is a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Kharagpur and heads the Rajendra Mishra School of Engineering Entrepreneurship. His current interests include human-computer interaction, computer analysis of Indian classical dance, which is something I learned about the other day, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, technology-enabled education, and software engineering. So I'll hand it over to Professor Das to propose uh, a grand vision for a SARC regional cooperation on global heritage. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. It's really nostalgic to be back here in this uh, UNESCO building to conduct uh, the next uh, version of KEDL without the presence of Indrajit. I, I know maybe some of you haven't met him, uh, but those who had would understand our repeated recollection of this great person. In fact, uh, this initiative of uh, creating a SARC platform was one of the key points that Indrajit and I had discussed by the sidelines of 2017. And uh, we were supposed to hold a meeting in Paris in 2018 to initiate the process, which could not happen because of his failing health and eventual demise. But I'm happy that we have been able to assemble together to take that vision forward. <clears throat> With that note, uh, uh, Ben has uh, given the basic perspective of why we are here. And uh, this is being called a keynote. I mean, I'm not an, really an expert of any of the things that I'm going to talk here. I'm more an aggregator of knowledge by now. So, But I wanted to make a small presentation on what's <clears throat> happening around the world in terms of digital heritage and how I see that digital heritage is becoming a very effective tool of cooperation and growth in global as well as specialized regional areas. So so just to you know, recap uh, what digital heritage is, we all know what is heritage. And we all are familiar with the three major well-accepted dimensions of heritage, tangible, intangible, and natural. Uh, but as <clears throat> we'll, we have seen for long, that as we move from library to digital library, it is just not a digital version of a library, which is a digital library, because it gives you opportunities which go well beyond the digital presentation of content. Because it also, in my view, gives you an opportunity to create a kind of virtual heritage. And uh, <clears throat> UNESCO, in its uh, agenda, has been uh, very supportive, very constructive about this. And this is uh, what I uh, show on the slide there is, is actually lifted from UNESCO's statements on their website. It's made up of computer-based materials of enduring value. And enduring value is of a great uh, significance here. That should be kept for future generations. But when you talk digitally, there is a lot more than the typical heritage that we can do. Certainly, on your left, you can see the first thing that uh, we start talking about is documentation, which, is, which has been there 
in certain form, in physical form for several centuries possibly, but in digitally it becomes far more powerful to document, subsequently to represent, and finally to present or disseminate. So that's where virtuality starts creating a lot of new dimensions. And I will just uh, later in my uh, presentation take a make references to some of the great uh, projects that India has been uh, involved in, in terms of using these expansions of virtual heritage technologies to act not only <coughs> create a digital uh, version of the heritage, but create tools which can actually help preserve and present heritage. So in that context, uh, this is again <coughs> from UNESCO's charter. So uh, UNESCO, I find, is a, is a great partner in terms of working on heritage, and especially digital heritage. And UNESCO has a published charter for digital uh, heritage, which says resources of human knowledge or expression, whether cultural, educational, scientific, and administrative, or embracing technical, legal, medical, and other kinds of information are increasingly created digitally or converted into digital form from existing resources. So that's the context of the charter. And what it says in terms of the second point is the resources are born digital. Now, in the context of heritage, a lot of new born digital contents have started appearing. Because when we talk in the context of library, it's significantly two-dimensional documents we are talking of. But when we go to heritage, then it significantly gets a third dimension because there are a lot of particularly tangible physical heritage has three-dimensional presence. A lot of intangible heritage like music, like dance, have a very strong temporal dimension. It is, as, as we professionals call it, a two two and a half dimensional space where you have a two dimensional view which keeps on changing in the third temporal dimension. I'm particularly in the dance uh, and in, in music it happens in the audio domain. And uh, quite a rich reference to that we, I mean, I'm, I hope most of you have been present in Harry's presentation yesterday. So we have heard about his, their time travel project. Probably it's called Time Machine, right? the Time Machine Project, which talks about this new dimension of born digital contents. And they create a kind of heritage dimension where the vision is going up to actually taking this uh, three-dimensional visions over time. And that's what he, he called as four-dimensional heritage view. So UNESCO's charter is ready for supporting these kind of data, these kind of initiatives. And that's what primarily we want to leverage. So I'll just take a look around some of the major digital heritage initiatives across the world. I'm sure most of you would be aware of most of these initiatives, but that's to bring all of us at the same platform and then take that agenda forward in terms of what we can do as a in terms of a SERP platform. Library of Congress, though not probably is a, is a leader in digital heritage collection, but certainly is the most leading library in the world, which uh, you know, has some unbelievable number of user base and content collection was created primarily for, I'm sorry, primarily for the purpose of the Congress, but in terms of their activities, in terms of their coverage, there is a very varied number of different heritage programs. They are very strong in terms of newspaper program. In fact, uh, while uh, I was visiting Library of Congress in 2018 summer, uh, so actually John, who made the WDL presentation, he was guiding uh, me through. He was still then was with Library of Congress. So he wanted to say, tell me a, your vernacular newspaper that you are familiar with. Input. So I said one, 
thinking that he's, he's kind of joking. Then he went and showed me the previous day's edition of that newspaper. So I mean, I'm just trying to say that Library of Congress looks at a heritage which is very integrative, very global. Naturally, keeping aside the challenges of heterogeneity or homogeneity, all this, the fact that sheer collection gives you a view which is very expansive. But in, in, in uh, my personal assessment, since this is so expansive, this finally does not have a single or a few very strong heritage motives or cultural dimensions because with that much of diversity, you really cannot have a very strong message inside, but a great collection, a great effort, and great lot of things to learn from the Library of Congress. Moving on, uh, it would be, I mean, kind of, may not be very proper for me to comment because the expert is right here. We have heard Harry yesterday. But I have been really fascinated and I really started thinking about uh, a SART platform after I learned about the European as experience in depth. <clears throat> and just to recollect what uh, Harry commented and earlier Paul and others had told me is uh, the European Union drives European and this was decided again at the time when a giant corporate power, Google, wanted to, in the guise of being very generous to culture, actually trying, was trying to do a monopolization of culture. And if you go across different big libraries in the United States itself, I was recently at uh, uh, Las Vegas Clark County Public Library, New York Public Library, all of them have had Google Books program with Google, where the offer was really difficult to resist from. Google offered, as Harry was explaining, that they will come in with every all resources. They will take the books that are copyright free, digitize them, give you a copy, and so on. The TNC apply, terms and conditions apply, written in font size six or five, is for 15 years, Google will hold the rights to disseminate that content. Again, in the, in the first look, that looks like, well, a very you know, generous offer, because if you get disseminated through Google, then your visibility is extremely huge. But what subsequently started concerning people is, if it disseminated through Google, then Google filters apply. And nobody knows what those filters actually are. How much of those filters are in terms of organic mechanisms, which are applied in terms of which contents are being more popular and so on. Question is, uh, if you are talking about digital heritage, do you really want always that the organic filter would come in? Because in terms of heritage, often a content is really valuable because it's scarcely viewed, scarcely known. So it's not Google's generic principle is more viewed is more important, is applicable in certain context. In context of heritage, it may actually be dangerous. So which will mean that more of the you know, marginal heritage items will get even more marginalized. But heritage's whole effort is to balance the, the value, human value, the cultural value that we have. And eventually, I learned that most of the major public libraries eventually has closed down that Google Books program. They have showcased scanner saying Google project used to be here. But of course, whatever has been scanned is already there. You can't take that back. So it's important to note. <coughs> now, I would also uh, mention in this that it is not only the big giant libraries. We were toddling at 2016 had about maybe one million content somehow collected from different sources and very little we could put together from ours. Notably, it was uh, Shottojit Rai, the great filmmakers, 39 film scripts which only existed and still is the only source on NDLI. 
When Google Books actually made an offer, they came over and they made a similar offer to us that be the coordinator, get the books, we will digitize, give you a copy, everything, you don't have to pay. We didn't know much about all these background. I just from instinctively said no. I don't know why I said no. But I, I said no because I was not well informed. I said, then I kept on asking who did this, who did this. They said, we did it there, we did it there. I said, tell me few countries where you are doing it. They had very few to answer and none of so-called the more active countries. So it is, on one side, it is a great initiative. I mean, we shouldn't only uh, criticize the commercial attention to heritage because that also brings in resources, brings in money. If collaborating in the right way could be effective, but at the same time, there are risks which we'll have to assess. But subsequently, learning more from European, what really struck me is, well, this was probably a trigger, but necessarily helped European Union to react with it in a very positive way. Deciding to create an identity for a, one of the most diverse region of culture, so many languages, so many different deep historical background, often very aligned, often extremely combative in the past, but it's remarkable to see how European Union could rise and create something like European. And there's a great to learn from that. I'm very happy uh, Harry is here. Ben has been quite involved in all these as well. So if you look into this and that the way this has been structured, had a little bit discussed about that as well, particularly <coughs> Harry was talking more on the collection side and the teachers and all that. But as you can see, there are different varied dimensions and it is important to understand those. There are components in develop, which is really good learning platform cooperation platform for all those who want to work more inside the technology. There's research quite a bit of. There's a networking component. So gives you not only an instance of a great digital heritage library, but a great digital heritage library framework. That's very important because uh, it means that uh, if we manage to do something together, there is a lot of wheels we do, which we do not need to rediscover. The practices, best practices are available. Most of the knowledge created in this process is open. There are very good documents in terms of what are the issues in rights and how to manage them, how to address those. So this gives a very good, I mean, at least reference for us to go forward on this. Uh, trove is another which is which uh, is not an aggregation in that national sense and in, in that you know multi country sense but it is uh, it is an initiative which I find again very fascinating because it again takes a dimension which uh, tries to for example focus very significantly on indigenous knowledge i'm just trying to pick up you know components from different initiatives which I see a strong similarity with what we have in terms of the Sark region. So indigenous knowledge is something, again, which the Sark countries have in a, in a great extent. And Trove has been doing really great work in terms of, and they have a great focus to bring in all those indigenous knowledge, languages, and all that in terms of this platform. Besides, somehow Trove has gone, got known for their newspaper program because that's a, that's a great one. Uh, but this has been a great effort to learn from as well. And if you look into the structure again, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to not only see the end user value, but I mean, I'm trying to somewhat look at it from creator's perspective as to does it give a framework, a framework that we can adopt from. So you can see that they, they have a 
very well structured framework which in, in matters where if we decide and align with those activities, we can really use that framework. And Trove has been uh, also been very connected to us through uh, right statements, steering committees. Trove representative could not finally uh, be present in KEDL. They were invited and they had accepted initially, but couldn't make time. So this is the second uh, that I would like to point out to you. Uh, DPLA is, is more, more, as it says, Digital Public Library of America is uh, more an America, USA centric effort. It's a derivative one, uh, but has been uh, in the leading with European in several of the gen generic issues and solutions that uh, came in this space. Uh, very significantly, it follows a similar uh, hub and spoke model that uh, Harry was uh, mentioning about. And uh, it also brings in another different aspects of the point that, uh, well, if this initiative, such an initiative has to happen, there needs to be a strong partner to back or support the whole thing. DPLA, as I understand, has gone through several, you know, it's, it's kind of the model in which NDLI currently works. It's a funded project. So DPLA often has gone through that and has gone through its ups and downs. And we have seen uh, very active friends of DPLA being, you know, being bad goodbye. No, not many positions and so on. So. Those are other aspects that we have to keep in mind that it's, 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 uh, it may be euphoric to start an initiative, but unless we, are, we have some vision into the sustainability, it's finally not going to be there for a while. World Digital Library, we heard the creator speak last night. It's a, it's a, it has been a very you know, in terms of quality of what it produces, it's a, it's a great effort. Multiple languages, all, you know, even languages plus Portuguese. And uh, a relatively small collection of about 20,000 items. But if you look into the depths of what has been created, if you look into the user connect that these items have, is exceptionally different from most other initiatives. But naturally, John yesterday pointed out the different dimensions of what was right and what was wrong. And the core concern, I mean, core point to take back is you need a sustainability model, which WDL unfortunately could not have. There has been revival proposals for WDL. I was fortunate to be present in that formative meeting we haven't had the follow-ups which were supposed to happen in September, October this year, so I do not exactly know what's happening. Uh, some other organization is trying to take that up. Those stories apart, but one thing I feel is to, is to learn strongly from WDL is how to ensure quality and uniformity of presentation. I would not call homogeneity, but uniformity of presentations is no matter which culture you are looking at through WDL, you will have a similar experience. And that probably is quite difficult to create, but it's a great effort anyway. These are, for example, this timeline is a very great feature in, in uh, WDL, which gives you a very nice picture in terms of, on a certain event or a certain you know, concept, how heritage has evolved over a period of time. And I'm sure this has been a great uh, amount of effort required to create this. Uh, DLME, Digital Library of the Middle East, uh, it's, still, it's still not a, it's still kind of a evolving project. And I kept it, and as I had expected, uh, Ezekiel also mentioned about this because this is some kind of, talking about some kind of a virtual uh, heritage because it's been created, motivated by the fact that uh, there's uh, terrorism not only against the property and human life and business, but there is terrorism against culture, there's terrorism against ethnicity, there's terrorism against heritage. And 
In the certain Middle East region, this has been identified to be really threatening, where libraries are getting burnt and monuments are being pulled down. So DLME has been an effort to preserve and revive uh, those in a, in a digital form. So it's, a, it's an initiative of a little different kind. It's again a completely funded project. So it's till to get its you know, strong foundation or its uh, sustainability in place. And it's supported primarily by the Antiquities Coalition. So uh, what I'm trying to point out is this talks about a uh, you know, collaboration, which is not exactly geographical in nature or Primarily, the uniformity of the culture is not the first objective. The first objective is the nature of threats that have come in in terms of the heritage. So each one of these has, has a strong you know, binding thread on which that initiative has been uh, created. Uh, there's another which I wanted to talk on, but I couldn't actually, yeah, uh, that I, I could not uh, really, you know, uh, collect enough material in English to be able to do that. That uh, initiative is called uh, SRILA. It's a Silk Route International Library Association, Alliance possibly, uh, which is driven by National Library of China. And uh, so uh, in, in the past, there used to be a Silk Route from the Middle East to China, which is to go through a uh, couple of thousand kilometers in parts of India and different other countries. So. There's an initiative on that. Unfortunately, uh, about uh, even though about 40% of the Silk Route actually passed through Didan, India, India is not a part of Srila. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm not very sure about the inclusiveness of that project. But uh, and another main difficulty, since it's driven by China, that it's very significantly documented in Chinese, even about the library and also I couldn't get enough information on that, but it does exist. So does, again, talk about the fact that people do try to recognize heritage and preservation in geographic terms, in terms of threats, as well as in terms of certain strong practices the past had. So Silk Route is what gave a trade <coughs> route, which then, because of the trade, created a different type of culture and heritage. If you look through all these, then these are some of the points that uh, I mean, come out as common public access, interoperability, provide, preserve, and promote are the main things that are happening, build capacity, shared history, new knowledge. So these are what these libraries are creating. Uh, <clears throat> I'll take a, a very quick look in terms of uh, some of uh, the Indian initiatives. How much time do I have? Then? I can uh, skip this. Also. Five or seven minutes. Okay. So, India and kind of when I start talking about heritage and say India, uh, in my mind I am really confused because if I talk about what is presently politically the boundary of India, then it gets very difficult to define this heritage. For example, uh, tomorrow you will hear a professor from Curtin University, he's talking on digital temples and when you talk about Indian temples, it's you can never characterize them with the current political boundary of India because it goes way down to <coughs> Myanmar, even beyond. On that side, goes up to uh, at least crosses Peshawar. So, but this is the characteristic dimensions of uh, heritage that you can see: either temples, murals, paintings, uh, sculpture, and uh, of a very wide uh, time period, manuscripts, and very wide dimensions. Now, what uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll not go into details, neither I have time. And also the fact that uh, both of these projects that are mentioned here will be particularly spoken of by the creators tomorrow. So one is digital heritage preservation, where the main focus is using digital technologies in varied forms of reconstruction. So that when, for example, if you look between, this is the current structure, which is, this is uh, somewhere in Karnataka. So this is the current model of the current structure, which currently exists. And by other documents and, uh, you know, other skates and all that, it has been reconstructed. You can see this part, 
which actually has got torn down. You can see here, this is broken, this is reconstructed. So there is a <coughs> big set of efforts in terms of reconstructing and not only reconstructing by extrapolation of what currently exists in the structure, but you use a varied amount of knowledge, including uh, you know, information from different manuscripts, reportings by different visitors, as well as paintings and do reconstruction. So we'll hear uh, Professor Shantanu Chaudhuri tomorrow, who will talk on these efforts. Uh, uh, these are, uh, after you have, you know, if you take a region, if you have reconstructed it uh, virtually, then you can actually create a virtual tour, which uh, this uh, teams are trying to do, so that you can show that it's not only what the reconstruction could have been, but if you were in the, say, in the 600 AD and walking on this field, then how would it feel? So I think these are, these are great dimensions in terms of uh, what uh, different projects are doing. This is our modest effort in terms of uh, digitization, which I've just got started. Now, <clears throat> I would conclude in two minutes with the, uh, reinforcing the agenda. So having seen all these over the last uh, two and a half years that I've been extremely, I mean, uh, you know, extensively traveling in US, in Europe, uh, and in this region as well, I, it does strike, strike me that amongst us in the Serb countries, we have a heritage which is significantly common because we have had a lot of common trade, we have common food habits, we have a extremely overlap language boundaries. I mean, if India, we are talking about 22 languages of India, that does cover all languages almost that uh, SARC countries uh, deal with. I mean, we share Bengali with Bangladesh, we share Tamil with uh, Sri Lanka, we share Nepali with Nepal and so on. And we have been, this region have been significantly been ruled by a common ruler who contributed uh, very significantly in terms of building up a education system. And so after, after the, the history of different geographic boundaries put on that region, the education systems remain more or less similar. The cultural evolution remains more or less similar. So it does make sense that physically we may be separated, but virtually we can again combine together. And that's the digital heritage dimension of SAG that I'm trying to visualize. And when you try to do that, uh, you have to cut through several government tapes. And uh, uh, to, to put uh, matters straight, uh, this pro uh, my, our project is under MHRD, and public libraries are in, uh, under Ministry of Culture. In four years, I have not been able to meet, make these two ministries meet and uh, make NDLI available through public libraries. Given that state of government affairs, I'm not, I've not been very hopeful of taking it absolutely to the government level and doing it in the way European Union did. So that's where I find UNESCO to be a great partner because it can cut through. If you go through UNESCO, no government questions you. You are a UNESCO partner. So if, and UNESCO is very positively reacted to that. So that's what I mentioned, mean by neutral umbrella. So because we, our only interest is preserved the cultural heritage of our region, and we can create very effective cultural programs. UNESCO has offices in almost all of these countries. This office itself uh, covers about five of the countries. So. <clears throat> you actually have more time than I realized. I was, I was no, that's, that, 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 that's, that, that, that's fine. You're good. Uh, so I, I want to end with uh, a, a few questions, which I'm sure the panel can, can talk up and discuss. Uh, <clears throat> so first, naturally, we would like to hear about reactions to this kind of seed proposal that what the different countries think about the digital heritage. To know about the situation in different countries, I, I have some little idea about some of them, like some part of what's happening in Bangladesh but not generically about most of them. So what kind of efforts, projects, policies do participating countries have in this field? Uh, would the participating countries be open to digital heritage exchange? That's, that's a very basic requirement. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on integrated exchange platform? How do you think we, whether UNESCO as a platform? I mean, I think I think we should be open in terms of discussing this. UNESCO is just a proposal. They have been supportive, but that does not necessarily mean that that's the only way we should look at UNESCO can support in, uh, in terms of uh, if we use other platforms, for example, do we directly go to SARC and request SARC as, as a platform and UNESCO to come with us? What kind of heritage programs would you want to collaborate on with India in specific? This is, uh, I, I wanted to raise this question because uh, we have some infrastructure created as a, in terms of a digital library. So, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a physical existence of a virtual world now, which is pretty much under our control. So maybe quite a few things can be immediately built up on that. Knowledge wills can be exploited. And there are a number of uh, digital heritage projects and initiatives in India which we are trying to bring together. So one way, for example, the digital temple project, when you'll hear from Professor Dottu, you'll hear that he has actually worked with five or six countries to create that temple map. It's not limited to the Indian boundary. And <clears throat> certainly more on what are the ways that UNESCO can facilitate these exchanges. We will have hear from UNESCO representatives in terms of what options exist for this platform. So that was my uh, modest thought on proposing that uh, we in this region come together and try to uh, take effective steps because it may not be uh, antiquity coalition saying that there is threat on digital heritage or specific attack on digital heritage, but I'm sure all of us also keep seeing that there has been degeneration, natural or otherwise, like I remember the earthquake in Nepal destroyed you know, several volumes of uh, manuscripts which will never be found again. So uh, in this context, uh, I would hand it over back to Ben to uh, conclude this and subsequently in the panel, I'm sure we'll have a good deliberation and we have experts here from outside the panel also to learn from. Thank you all very much for the time. Thank you, Professor Das. It's a, it's a, it's a very inspiring proposal and it's, it's thrilling to be present for uh, what could be the beginning conversation of a, a about this. I think there's nothing left for me to do but to kind of bring this to a close toward the tea break. Uh, and then I think after a short pause, we will uh, move this into a panel discussion mode. Um, just bringing it back to some of the things I was mentioning at the top, I think this is an opportunity not just to survey the landscape, which Professor Doss has very capably done, uh, but to think about opportunities when you're starting something fresh to, to maybe leap ahead and, and, and uh, adopt a different paradigm. Again, recalling some of the early experiments and in, in that kind of blend of institutional cooperation with, with uh, cr broad-based crowdsourcing, uh, these ways of making meaning-making with, with your audience. Um, also, what you know, we're looking at a lot of web-based platforms, and obviously the world has moved in a very different direction. What would a mobile-first uh, digital heritage fabric look like for this region? Uh, perhaps a, a different mode of curation. What if what if what if uh, uh, what if citizens of the of these of these uh, countries could receive uh, one artifact a day on their phones with with deep context? Uh, just it's an opportunity, I think, to think in a different way about aggregating heritage. That how do you actually make it meaningful to people's lives? Sometimes scale is actually not the way to go. I think there's almost an addiction to scale. The large numbers that we post about these aggregator projects, um, the scale does matter, but I think. Uh, there's also an intimacy to heritage that we want to foster, and that we can lose sight of that when we're trying to build these massive platforms. So I think just some things to kind of to ponder. Uh, I think we've sometimes been, have been reinventing the wheel uh, despite best intentions. So I think this is a very exciting opportunity to think boldly and innovatively and show the world how it could be done uh, even better. So. Would anyone like to ask any question? Anybody? Good morning to everyone and. Uh, I am very much delighted to have uh, such kind of presentation uh, by Professor uh, P. P. Das. Sir, uh, could we uh, correlate to the SARC charter towards the SARC secretariat regarding this uh, on the umbrella of uh, UNESCO like this? Because uh, SARC charter specifically, Article 5 uh, mentioned that education, human resource development and youth mobilization under this article heritage and uh, this cultural heritage used to um, uh, <coughs> incorporate with uh, like this. So 
Sark Secretary now it is in Nepal. So I think UNESCO uh, can take initiatives to go through the Sark countries. Then it would be more officialized. And uh, our, beside uh, your proposal or beside your thoughts, whatever you say, the modest thought, so that would be enriched uh, for this. So my proposal is that how can we correlate the things with the NDL, with the SARC charter? Uh, uh, actually, that's a that's little bit more on the procedural side. So when we, uh, myself, uh, Ejekil, Ashita, when we deliberated on this, uh, this session, there was a thought as to whether we involve SARC as well. We stayed away from that because uh, we felt that first we need to decide amongst ourselves what we want. Proposal comes at a next stage, so we have to work on that proposal. It's, it's just because uh, NDLI uh, has been working and I just thought that, I mean, some of us just thought that let there be a, a platform for a common digital heritage will not make things happen. Till uh, the partners uh, also can think, deliberate, they have to go back, talk to their colleagues, and then those are the procedural steps which uh, will be, I'm sure, worked out in time. Um, I have uh, not questions. Uh, I just wanted to say regarding Bangladesh, you know, we are doing a uh, lot of things in digital libraries and we are doing a lot of works, uh, not, uh, you know, combinedly. We are working uh, basically individually. So I think awareness building is very important um, in Bangladesh, especially in policy, uh, those who are involved with policy making. So do you have any plan to organize uh, some collaboration or like any training or workshop, uh, for, uh, especially for awareness building program? So in that case, the, um, the government of Bangladesh, uh, they do realize, but they will be give more importance to do um, such kind of you know, collaboration between the third countries because this is a very initial level, so we need to work on that. I, I think it will be best to uh, you know, deliberate on this I mean, in the panel or towards the end, mm -hmm. because once we <coughs> know the situation of the region, I mean, there are other representatives as well. Then, and he will also be, pre uh, you know, yeah. also be presenting yeah. in the panel. Sir would also be presenting. So we can certainly discuss oh, that. It was a very nice presentation. I would uh, really like to know about the uh, contents that you would like to include in your uh, these sort of projects. Because, uh, for example, in Bangladesh, there are different sort of indigenous groups. So there are different sort of cultures uh, in Bangladesh they are, that has been there. So how would you like gather their, uh, what they have to provide you? How would you collect those things? Similarly, uh, not only resources or materials, um, there are some even, there are uh, stories that our grandparents used to tell us that these are the uh, culture of these places and there are lullabies that has been lost, I suppose. Uh, so how do you think that you can preserve those sort of things? Like, <coughs> would you go from person to person and you would uh, like collect those things from them? Like it's sort of a management of indigenous knowledge or some kind of tacit knowledge management. So how would you plan to do all this? We are we are talking about a vision. That the way it goes is if you start around a vision. If you agree on the vision, then you have to first decide what is your mission statements. And then comes uh, you know, working out a scope and broad objectives. Then you have to decide on the processes that you will set up. And you know, actual contents or you know, procedures of doing it will come much later. Because if we hurriedly jump to that, that then, then we will not have a structure to that whole thing. Right? So obviously those questions will come up, those contexts I'm sure, context of lullabies I'm sure is there in each of the countries. Yes, and yes, and it, 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 is, it is very, very important to uh, preserve, preserve those. those. But that's not the only way, but we are at the vision level right now. So if you have something to comment on, on that as to whether the appropriateness or the specificity of that, no, this that, is a very that's what, much, yeah. what will be more relevant tonight. Yes, now, we'll naturally have to come to all these if we agree on the vision and start moving. Okay? Thank you so much.
I thought it was incredibly interesting to see or to hear from you, Professor Das, the sort of the, the comparative study that you've made uh, across the digital libraries. Um, I would ask, actually, Mr. Dlamini, if he could uh, elaborate a little bit on the role that he thinks UNESCO wants to and can play in, in as a convener. Uh, I think Professor Das was absolutely right, I think. Uh, all these initiatives, uh, at the end of the day, um, stand or fall uh, with um, a very strong political and policy convener uh, in this space. And I'm very happy to see that uh, we're now here at UNESCO premises. I think that's a very good sign. I think UNESCO has that mandate, if you want, uh, deeply enshrined in every piece of paper that we've produced. Uh, but is it now a very active... Um, strategy of UNESCO to be to be to want to play that role and maybe you can help us a little bit we all know that UNESCO works um, through programs um, and projects but mainly programs and our work in this area also has been guided by programs and the program that has been um, guiding us is called the memory of the world That's, that has been the major one um, the other smaller programs but that has been the major one that program um, I'm sure you're all aware, is experiencing some challenges. And most of the challenges that, are, um, that it's experiencing um, are not um, because of the work that it's designed to do. It's political difficulties between <laughs> countries about nominations and so on. And these do come up once, you know, once in a while. Uh, for instance, if a country, country A nominates a document and claims to be originating from them, then country B says, no, we also have a claim on what you're nominating. And then it becomes political. This, these, are, these are things that happen. So that's the, 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 the difficulties that this program is having at the moment. <coughs> As a result of that, we cannot, um, at, uh, at the moment, proce uh, process or accept nominations globally. Um, we are also advising that uh, regional and national nominations also be on hold for the same reason that we, these disputes must be clarified. Actually, what is being clarified are the guidelines for nominations. How do we verify, how do we consult, and how do we arrive at a nomination that is widely or broadly accepted. That's, that's the direction we're trying to, we're trying to um, go towards. To answer your question, um, however, the work has not stopped. Uh, there is a lot of work that we can still do, uh, certainly as a, as, as a region. There is work in terms of looking at our policies. If our policies are ready for cross-border sharing or exchange in this, in this field, there is work on standards that we can still do. It's got nothing to do with nominations, just work with standards. Um, work with policies and standards can be actually from the top, but also can be at the bottom. We can go down to drafting policies that government can adopt. So it can really be concrete work. But there's work also on training. Um, there is work that I, uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, that we can do to enhance our collections and make it more accessible to people with disabilities. <coughs> so there's a lot of work that we can work on concretely to, uh, you know, to move forward uh, the you know, collaboration and cooperation within the region. What can UNESCO do? UNESCO obviously can help with consultations uh, consultations within a country. Uh, it was interesting uh, to hear concerns uh, you know, from Bangladesh because there are similar concerns in, in other countries in the region. About uh, Even yesterday I had somebody outside the, the auditorium saying that, oh, we, uh, NDLI is fantastic accessing the world. What about the, the archive in the village <laughs> or in the state somewhere? Um, it's still forgotten. Well, these things do, you know, they are there and they need to be attended to eventually. So there are realities, those realities are, you know, development is still an ongoing process. Uh, but before we can even harmonize, if you are, I go back to the term that we don't want to use here, before we can harmonize the, 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 the collection, let's have the standards, let's have the policies in place. So that at least as we collect and as we preserve and as we develop, this resource, we can then have this also uh, cross-border or transponder, uh, trans, uh, transboundary uh, kind of exchange as a platform co for collaboration. So UNESCO is there for you in consulting, also consulting within the country, but also in the region. 
uh, UNESCO is, here, is there for you to support, uh, hopefully draft a, a project that can address some of the specific requirements that, that we, can, uh, we can come up with here. Uh, UNESCO also is there to share with you uh, global lessons and guide a process that we may want to um, embark on as, as, as a country, or uh, I, would, I would prefer as a region rather than countries, but you know, even individual countries, of course, have got the right to come to UNESCO for, for, for lessons, uh, global lessons that we may have. Also, we have access to um, a pool of uh, international consultants, of course. Uh, what is a challenge for UNESCO is the resources, the financial resources, but that's where then now we need to we need to work out the modalities. How do we achieve this? But these are there, and UNESCO has access to, to all these resources if the financial resources are sorted out. That's a brief answer, maybe. <laughs> or is it a long one? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delamini. We just take one last question from Ms. Subagya. Uh, your presentation is so useful and fast. And I'd like to know about uh, the cooperation about the NDLI, and National Archives of India, and uh, ASI. Uh, because the ASI also working the digital documentation, and National Archives also ha of India also have a <coughs> documentation. How you doing the cooperation between the three organizations? Because all are working for the cultural heritage. So I like to know that. Uh, that's that's a good question, natural question, and uh, uh, there are naturally India is a mini world in terms of uh, size, diversity, and challenges. So uh, on one side, uh, I'm proposing uh, cross-border cooperation. And internally, I'm trying to you know, bridge borders between two ministries. So ASI, or National Archives, or for that matter, National Library. We are National Digital Library of India, very carefully named. There's a National Library of India. These entities come under Ministry of Culture. They have their own programs of digitization and dissemination. Unfortunately, till date, we haven't seen those digitized items disseminated. For several reasons. I mean, this is not the platform to discuss the reasons, but that's the reality. So <clears throat> the way we stand is we have in principle agreement with I ASI to cooperate on this, but uh, on ground nothing has happened. But I'm hopeful, always. You know, when, uh, when we got uh, started in the first phase, um, you know, several ministries were not even ready to talk to us. They said, go, you, you go and create school books. That should be your mandate. But in, in the second phase, many ministries came and said that, why are we not covered? So we will bridge this gap. But uh, certainly when we are, I'm talking about uh, digital heritage, all of these different agencies in India will also have to contribute. But there is, beyond this, also there is a huge amount of heritage content in digital form currently also available in India. So there is ground to start working. Thank you, Dr. Das. Thank you, Mr. Varshbo and Dr. Das for the insightful session. May I please request Mr. Dalamini to present the memento to Mr. Vershbo.